Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hi, and welcome to the Australian Water School's uh, second Python webinar. In today's webinar, we'll be covering applications specifically for hydrology and hydrogeology. And just to set the stage for this webinar, one of the intentions of this one is also to serve as an introduction to some upcoming courses where you will get to do your own coding. So looking forward to that. Um, my name's Cray. I will be your host today. Uh, welcome to all of the attendees from around the world. We're thrilled to have your attendance um, from wherever you're attending from today. Um, and if I could fast forward into the future, I could also welcome then all of those who will be watching this recording uh, at a later date. So thank you for your interest in this topic specifically and for supporting the Australian Water School in general. Let's introduce uh, our experts today, Luke Peters, Chris Turnage, and Vincent Post. Luke and and Chris were on board for our previous uh, Python webinar. They stayed mainly in the background on that one, answering questions behind the scenes. Uh, today, they'll be running the show and be joined by Vincent Post in his, uh, I think, his inaugural water school debut here. Thank you for those who filled out the poll results. Um, as usual, uh, commercial and consulting uh, comes out on top for what the sectors that everybody's from. Uh, and also, if you look at that second question on uh, visualization, no surprise that almost everybody's familiar with Excel. Uh, but then when we look at uh, some of these other ones, um, you know, Python does get a lot of interest, uh, a few others with not as much. Um, and then the uh, rounding out the experience in question number three, uh, you can see some of the um, different uh, packages that others, uh, that the attendees have used, and then um, really wanted to get a feel for the topics today. Uh, that you're going to hear about and which ones would get the most interest. And that looks pretty evenly split. Um, almost everybody wants to hear about almost everything. So we'll try to get to as much of that as possible. We are split uh, pretty evenly, a little closer above the ground or more above the ground than below the ground uh, as far as surface water versus groundwater. But that doesn't look to be too much of a surprise either. So uh, Luke, Chris, uh, Vincent, um, you know, if, as you have a look at those, uh, maybe just introduce yourself briefly, tell us where you're coming to us from and um, tell us if there's any surprises that you see in those poll results maybe starting with you chris yeah sure thanks craig um yeah it's chris Turner here from adelaide in south australia yeah you can really see uh i was interested to see the um the, the fairly even split there amongst the topics that's nice to see um no particular standout there and um no surprise to see um excel is really the workhorse for most people uh, with for data analysis yeah definitely luke Hi, I'm Luke here, also based in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, and no, I'm always amazed to see how wide an international audience we've got here. And I think all continents bar Antarctica are represented. Um, and it's also good to see that there's so many people who have already been exposed or have some experience with Python. So um, that's really nice for, uh, for this presentation as well. Yeah, sounds good. And um, our attendee from the furthest away uh, today, at least from where we're at, uh, Vincent, um, yeah, if you wanted to uh, un unmute and uh, come on and let us know uh, where, where you're coming to us from and see if there's any uh, surprises uh, from the poll results. Hi there. Yeah, Vincent here from the Netherlands. Um, I'm still affiliated with Flinders University in Australia. So um, in my heart, I'm still close to Adelaide. Um, yeah, really good to see um, just what Luke said, that there are already people that are using Python. And um, what I've seen in the last decade or so is that the popularity of Python has just been growing. And of course, uh, we hope to promote it even further with uh, this webinar and the upcoming courses, because it's really a great tool. And um, I think that uh, every hydrologist will benefit from knowing about it. So yeah. Uh, really good to see that. And like I said, I hope we can promote it even further today. Sounds good. Um, if you haven't got a chance to see it before, I do recommend going back to uh, the previous webinar that we did back in uh, November. Um, if you're new to Python, and even if you're old to Python, it provided a good summary. Uh, Kevin Nibiolo uh, went through, uh, and, and really it, programming, you know, there's there are programming languages, and they, uh, you know, these are languages. And uh, Kevin does a great job in that one of covering grammar lessons, basically. You know, what are verbs and adjectives and nouns in a programming language. Um, and so he, that gives a great uh, background uh, for the things that we'll cover today. Um, so again, we, we classify the YouTube channel uh, for the Australian Water School with sequential numbers on the webinars. And that one is number 98. If you wanna Google that one or look that one up, uh, go ahead and watch that one if you get a chance. I think that would provide some great background. Um, 
we are going to break today's presentation into three parts that line up with three workshops that you'll be able to register for uh, going forward. Uh, we'll start uh, with Luke doing uh, data wrangling um, and then uh, uh, time series analysis by Chris, and then we'll get into data, data visualization uh, with Vincent. So with that, um, over to you, Luke. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in a few minutes uh, during the Q&A time. Thanks. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Craig, and all that content that you alluded to. In this webinar, we won't be able to teach you Python in, in such a short time. So what we decided instead was provide you a bit of a showcase of um, how we use Python in our day-to-day -day, um, work as researchers in hydrology and hydrogeology. And it's mostly around data wrangling, so importing, um, exporting data, uh, QA, QC, these kind of things, a lot of visualization and data analysis, processing that data, but also how we use Python in pre and post processing of models. So as Gray alluded to, um, there is a follow up on this, which is a more um, extensive course where we really will help you go through some work examples um, where we'll, that will be mostly based on Jupyter notebooks. Now, before I dive into showing all the greatness that Python is, why would you even consider looking at Python or any scripted language in um, in hydrology, um, and just a couple of main things that I uh, that I identify are things are important for me are um, main thing is automating repetitive tasks, um, so it saves a lot of pointing and clicking in Excel um, with some simple lines in in Python, um, but also gives you uh, access to functions and um, capabilities that you just don't have um, within Excel or other packages. Um, I'm working both in academia as and in um, kind of a government environmental impact assessment studies. And in those kind of studies, it's getting more and more important for us to do work that is transparent, reproducible and repeatable. And this is one of the biggest advantages to me from for uh, Python, especially in combination with notebooks, is that you can capture your entire workflow of your data processing from lo loading the data to the modeling to, to creating the figures that goes in go into the report. And anyone else can come after you and run exactly the same analysis and can figure out what you've done. And it has saved me on numerous occasions when you get to the end of a project and somebody asks you to change something or question something that you can go back and check what you've done six months ago and you've got everything nicely documented out there. Python is not the only language in uh, programming language. Um, there's things like MATLAB and R who have similar capabilities. What I do especially like about Python is that it's um, the support that it has. It is, um, there's a lot of packages available that give you enormous um, capability, uh, things like visualization, but especially data analysis and machine learning is um, readily available in, in Python packages. And a very important one as well is that Python is free. It's free as in free speech in that source code is usually freely available. So you can actually figure out how things are done. And it's also free as in free beer, as in you don't have to pay for it. So those are kind of the main advantages. And just to give you a bit of an example, this is one of those packages. This is created by a, a colleague of mine in, um, in CSRO. Um, and he wrote a, a package specifically specifically to access the database or the servers from the Bureau of Meteorology in, in Australia. So Bureau of Meteorology, um, they are the custodians of a lot of water data in Australia. And what this tool does, um, and the, the code that I'm showing here, it's very, um, what this is doing, it is requesting from the data server, uh, the time series in a groundwater bore uh, from 2016 to 2020. So it's really easy to use and you immediately have all the data and you can start plotting and you can do, it's got, in this case was a groundwater example, but it gives you access to lots of other things like any data they have, temperature, rainfall, or in this case, you can actually do a geographical search where you um, outline a bounding box and it gives you where all the gauging stations are in Australia within that bounding box. Now, that's very convenient and especially since somebody else has done all the heavy lifting of writing that package so you can actually just plug and play and off you go in your data analysis unfortunately that's not always the case and you'll often depending on where you get your data from you will have to write your own code or modify your own code so that it's customized to the data that you have 
So what I've got on this slide is some of the packages that I quite that I use quite a lot, especially the, the three at the top. Those are kind of my the workhorse packages that do most of the heavy lifting. So you've got NumPy, um, that is a lot of the numerical, cap um, numer uh, that's the key numerical package in Python. So it's got a lot of functionality of um, numerical analysis and data analysis. And it's got some functionality in importing and exporting data, but um, the package that is more suited for that is Pandas. Pandas is more designed to work um, with, um, with has a bit more database functionality, so and more um, options like importing and exporting uh, to Excel, um, and some advanced um, ways of indexing and filtering your data. So those two combined, you can start doing some pretty fancy um, data analysis and matplotlib. That's the key uh, package for visualization. So that's got most of your visualization capability in Python. Um, you can find within matplotlib. There's plenty of more advanced um, visualization options. And um, Vincent in the last presentation will give you a couple of examples of that as well. Just two more that I want to mention here um, is GeoPandas. Um, that extends the functionality of pandas to spatial data, to, fe to vector data. So this is a package where you can load shapefile data and basically start doing a lot of functionality that you otherwise would need a GIS environment for. And finally, um, scikit-learn, that is extending a lot of the NumPy capability in terms of data analysis. And it is a what I think of, I think it of as a, an entry, an easy version of machine learning. It makes a lot of machine learning algorithms available in a relatively easy format. That was kind of my intro bit. And this is, now I'm going into the, the showcasing things, examples of what I've, how I have used Python in the past and why and how I did that. So one of the main things for me is data visualization. So especially in hydrology, but especially in hydrogeology, data are very hard to come by, they're very costly. So when we have that precious data, you wanna make sure that your reports, your figures actually tell the story and tease out the what you learned from those data. So in this, on the left-hand side, what you see is a plot uh, that we made in Excel. It's um, hydraulic connectivity values of an, an aquifer system plotted against depth. And what we're trying to figure out here is, does connectivity change with depth? And especially in this case, the red dots is, uh, is an area that we wanna model and we wanna know whether there's a difference locally. Now from that scatter plot, it's really hard to tease out that kind of information. So to really answer those questions, I transformed that into box plots. So I bin the data in intervals of 25 meters in depth and then created box plots the gray ones represent the overall hydraulic connectivity values and the orange ones, the local one. And you can see from that, it's much easier to see that that trend is emerging of um, hydraulic connectivity decreasing with depth and in the local data that it is decreasing quite a lot faster than in the regional one. So again, so this is really a, a matter of cleaning up your data and finding a way of representing it so that it tells the story uh, that you're after. And that only gets in, gets even more important when you're talking with, uh, when you're working with multivariate data. So in this case, uh, hydrochemical data. Um, the Piper plot is a very it's a it's a very old visualization technique. It's I think from 1944, a way of representing the major ion chemistry of a water sample. Um, and what we've done here is I re uh, written a package to make those Piper plots in Python, and I gave each location in the Piper plot a unique color code so that you can actually transfer that back to your um, to your maps and see and look at the uh, chemical evolution of water. So in this case, if you look at the, the bottom right hand corner, uh, that plot is showing the uh, anion data, and you can see that the aquifer in the southeast is more dominated by, by carbonates waters, while if you go to the north, it transfers into more chloride samples. So you can start teasing out that question on what is happening in groundwater here that would cause this change in chemistry. We've taken that concept of using color in multivariate data visualization a bit further. Um, what I'm showing here is some results from remote sensing. So we've got a data cube of uh, SAR data. So um, basically we've got a satellite that takes images every 12 days. We've got 
over just over a year of data at a very high spatial resolution. So how are you going to visualize such a such a massive data set? So each pixel has its own time series. I used machine learning algorithms to uh, to cluster those time series values. Um, so that's what's in the squares on the right hand side. And each of those groups are given a, uh, a color code. And you can see that there is um, an intuitive order in that color so that all the reds are very similar and all the greens are very similar. Um, and use that to visualize the data again. And what you then see is that these patterns start emerging in your data. And in this case, this really helped us that kind of visualization, that exploring of your data set really helped us in finding an index, formulating an index for that kind of data to identify groundwater dependent ecosystems, um, in this case in uh, Northern Australia. Very different scale uh, of remote sensing. This is geophysical data. So one of my colleagues, he um, collected um, seismic data over a short transect just north of Adelaide. Um, he used this package by Gimli um, to process all of that information. So all the uh, geophysical inversion was done in, in Python and then followed by the visualization. And in this case, that actually helped us really um, in figuring out how the system works. Um, in this case, there was um, some small uh, depressions in the landscape and we could find from the seismic data that there was actually a small groundwater mound below them uh, indicating that there was um, localized recharge happening along those transits. And finally, this is kind of um, more the work I've been doing in the last couple of years is uh, using Python in processing of model data. Um, so I've been using the package uh, SALIP, for instance, for sensitivity analysis. In this case, it's a groundwater model that we ran um, and it had 38 parameters. And we wanted to figure out which parameters um, our outputs were sensitive to in terms of drawdown, flux, and groundwater level. And you can see the blue parameters, those are the ones for of importance for each of those uh, outputs. And unfortunately, in this case, the key prediction we were interested in, drawdown, um, was not very sensitive to the ones, to the parameters that we actually could constrain with data from flux and groundwater levels. Um, so that meant that calibration in this case was not uh, very useful. Anyway, this was a really whirlwind um, tour about some of the things that you can do in terms of data wrangling, visualization, and uh, processing. Um, and I'll hand over now to Chris, who's going to be, give a bit more of information on time series uh, processing, um, some examples from his work. Great, thanks, Luke. Um... Just to touch on some of the uh, the questions in the, we've had two uh, technical questions so far. Um, one was pr from Prafula um, asking if, compare, asking for a comparison of the numerical capabilities of Python compared to R. And really for myself, having not used R a lot um, or at much at all, uh, I can't really speak for R. Some of the other presenters might be able to later in the Q&A. Um, but I can say there's not too many numerical algorithms I have found that are missing from uh, the NumPy package for Python, um, except uh, maybe with the exception of um, dream-based optimization algorithms. Um, and so in this section of the presentation, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how Python has helped me um, perform time series analyses uh, more easily um, in, in less time and while also providing access to, some, to a range of high-level tools. Um, that aren't that would be really difficult to implement in um, an, an alternative like Excel. Um, so I'm going to focus on three aspects of time series analysis here. Just focus in on those. So um, data pre-processing, uh, the interpretation of responses to time lagged processes, and also the interpretation of responses to periodic processes. To start with, data pre-processing. Um, here I'm focusing on three aspects of pre-processing. In particular, um, so gap filling, resampling, and detrending. Uh, and for these uh, examples of these three tasks, I've got a, a tilt meter data set uh, that was uh, from a tilt meter that was installed in uh, Queensland in northern Australia. But uh, these applications here are um, totally relevant to typical hydro hydrological data sets as well. So uh, time series of pressure heads, hydraulic heads, uh, stage heights. Um, it, it's equally valid um, here. So 
Gaps are really common. In my experience, gaps are really common in measured time series data for a range of reasons. Things don't always go to plan. Um, and gap, filling the, these gaps can be a really time consuming process if it's done by hand using a, a non-scripted uh, software like Excel. So instead, automating the filling of these gaps can save a whole lot of time. And so uh, in this example here on the right, where I've got a couple of data gaps in this tilt meter data set, uh, here I've used linear interpolation to fill those gaps, which was sufficient for um, the, our subsequent analyses. Um, I just want to draw attention to um, there's a range of um, more complex uh, interpolants that are available in the uh, pandas package for Python. So polynomial spline, quadratic methods of uh, interpolation. Resampling is also a really common, uh, in my experience, really common task in time series analysis. Um, and this is the need to change the temporal resolution of an input data set. So sometimes this is because the measurements have fallen off the hour, um, which is due to logger clock drift. Um, other times it's because the resolution of the measured data is either too coarse or too fine. Um, and so we're using the tilt meter data here as an example, which was um, measured at a 30 second um, interval. Uh, I've got two examples here. So the, the second uh, plot here is downsampling those data to a, a coarser one minute resolution. Um, or alternatively, the third plot shows how these data um, have been upsampled to a finer 10 second resolution. Um, and both in both cases, this is, these are uh, one line implementations using uh, the pandas package. A third uh, common task um, in time series analysis is detrending or filtering. And this can be performed um, using time domain methods or frequency domain methods. So on this slide, I've used um, a moving average detrending as an example here. So um, again, using the um, tilt meter data in the first plot, I've, in the second plot, I've added, I've uh, plotted the, the three-day uh, window moving average in red over the data. And then, so in our analysis, we subtracted this from the data to result in the third plot, uh, which gave us a, a zero mean uh, residual, which, which is what we needed for our sub subsequent analyses. Alternatively, uh, this detrending uh, can be performed in the frequency domain um, and uh, uh, SciPy, uh, the SciPy package has a whole range of uh, frequency domain filters uh, for these detrending purposes. Uh, and so again, starting with the, the tilt meter data in the first plot, in the second plot, I'm showing the result of low pass filtering. So this is where we retain the, the low frequency content of the input data. Uh, and exclude the high frequencies. And alternatively, in the third plot, I'm showing the result of high pass filtering, uh, where, where we retain the high, high frequency information, but exclude the, the, the low, low frequency uh, information. It really depends on uh, the, the, fit, the, needs, the needs of your analysis. But in both of these examples, it, again, these are both one line implementations of a, of a, a frequency domain filter um, using a Butterworth uh, filter. So, the, uh, the second topic I uh, want to demonstrate here is the use of Python to interpret responses to time lagged processes. And these kinds of processes, this type of analysis, this is really common in hydrology. Um, and so the specific example I just want to show here is the response of groundwater pressures, so measured groundwater pressures in a well, uh, to changes in atmospheric uh, pressure uh, over time. And what happens in this case, uh, which is depicted in this schematic, is that there can be a time lag between the responses uh, in the well where the water level is measured and the response in the surrounding aquifer. And so the nature of this time lag, uh, we, we can in interpret this, we can interpret a few things from this, so including uh, aquifer confinement and, uh, and hydraulic properties. So the example I want to use here is um, these are some data that we uh, measured on Norfolk Island in the South Pacific. And this is where we measured groundwater pressures at two different locations. So these are shown on the, the plots on the right hand side. Uh, and the way we interpreted these was in terms of the way they responded to changes in barometric pressure, which we also measured. And that's shown on the left hand side here. Uh, and we did this using this regression deconvolution method. Uh, and so we characterise these groundwater responses um, using mixing models, uh, which are shown in the centre of the page here. 
Uh, and these mixing models are functions of time lag. And, and these, these are the outcomes of regression deconvolution. And as you can see, the, the shapes of the mixing functions uh, are quite different. And so they did vary at different places across the island. And so from, from the shapes of these, of these mixing uh, models, we were able to, th these provided insights to us uh, about variations in aquifer types and aquifer properties across, across Norfolk Island. And so uh, Python makes this type of analysis much easier um, through the, the use of the NumPy library uh, to perform those linear algebra uh, computations which are needed for regression deconvolution. And also the use of the SciPy library, uh, which provides um, a wide, wide range of optimization algorithms. The third and um, final topic I'd like to touch on here is the interpretation of responses to periodic or cyclic processes. And so the specific case uh, I'll use here as an example is the response of groundwater pressures uh, to the movements of the sun, the moon and planets, uh, which are known collectively as earth tides. And these are also the driver of um, ocean tides, which is a bit more well, well known. Um, and so in, in the subsurface, uh, these, are ocean, these earth tides um, particularly affect uh, deep confined aquifers uh, by varying the total vertical load upon these aquifers. And so there, there are a number of methods um, for interpreting responses to periodic processes, uh, including uh, Fourier transforms, periodograms, and harmonic least squares um, methods. And Python provides an easy access uh, to each of these, uh, as most of these are already implemented in as part of the SciPy uh, package. So for these examples, I'm using a, a different groundwater pressure data set. This time it was measured um, over a couple of years in Northern Australia, a site in Northern Australia. And so in a single line of code, uh, we, we can look at the, the amplitude and phase spectra uh, of the periodic, periodic components that are present in the input data uh, in only a, pretty close to a single line of code to, uh, to uh, get, get, achieve these results. So alternatively, uh, a different way of, look, uh, of uh, looking at the amplitude um, spectra uh, that are present in the input data is to use periodograms. And there's a, there's a number of periodograms that are available as part of the sci-fi package, um, including the Welch periodogram on the bottom left here, or the Lomskargel periodogram on the bottom right. And this last one is particularly um, valuable, useful. It's uniquely able to um, work with uh, non-uniformly sampled um, GAPI um, uh, data sets. And so uh, generally a bit, had the, being able to, to use these higher level um, features is really nice. Um, some of these methods would be really hard to um, implement in something like Excel. Um, lastly, um, if we are only interested in a number of um, limited number of frequencies rather than a full frequency band, then we can um, we can uh, calculate amplitude and phase information um, using a harmonic least squares approach, um, which again benefits um, from the the uh, the the, the the, 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 the NumPy and SciPy libraries, the built-in features there. And so um, I'm myself, I'm involved in I'm developing a Python package now with um, Daniel Schweitzer and others, um, a package named HydroGeoscience, uh, which uh, uh, allows um, something like this harmonic least squares method to be applied in only a single line of code. I'll finish up my section of the presentation here, um, but really I just want to finish on Hopefully I've demonstrated that uh, the utility of Python uh, for performing um, various uh, time series analysis, uh, various time series analyses um, by providing access to time series, um, by providing access to, to some time saving methods and really, really save a lot of time and, and also providing access to some pretty high level um, to methods as well, which really wouldn't be achievable otherwise. Um, often and often in only a, a, a single line or a few lines of code. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Vince. Thank you, Chris. Um, there was one question in the chat uh, from Yun Quan Cheng. 
asking what package did you use to detrend your data? Could you maybe comment on that before I continue? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Python, uh, sorry, Pandas. So Pandas is um, really well designed to deal with um, time series data um, using date times, um, date time indices. So um, yeah, there's, there's a, a trove of methods um, that are part of the Pandas library. Um, so that's, that is very much the, the first place I would start. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I hope you can all sh see the screen that I have in front of me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, data visualization. And um, there are really some great tools in Python to present uh, data. And this particular example that I will start with is um, uh, animation of uh, some modeling results. This is a groundwater model of a freshwater lens in a coastal aquifer. And what you see is the distribution between freshwater, which is the blue uh, color here, and saltwater underneath, that's the red here. And in this particular model, we have seven horizontal wells that are withdrawing freshwater. And because uh, we're remo uh, removing freshwater from the aquifer, we're also uh, going to draw in saltwater from below. And that's uh, undesirable, of course, because if the salinity in any of these wells becomes too high, it's no longer useful for potable water use. Um, and in this particular model, we tested what would happen if we would switch off the wells, uh, individual wells, as their salinity became too high. And um, I like to show this animation because it really shows how you can uh, combine different outputs from your model into a single uh, movie. So we're going to see the change in the salinity distribution. And that change in the salinity distribution is mainly triggered by the variations of groundwater recharge. So on top here, I have a graph, a time series graph going 30 years that shows the recharge rate in blue. And if I start the simulation, the animation, we will also see uh, the pumping rate. So here the pumping rate is indicated and here we are pumping at the maximum rate. So all wells are pumping, but you can also see here we are entering a dry period. The salinity is increasing. Yeah, the salt water is creeping up towards a well. So we have to switch off a number of wells um, uh, that are becoming too saline. And you can see then that uh, I can visualize this by plotting lower bars. Yeah? So if the bars drop, it means that the total discharge is less because we are switching some of, of some of the wells. And I can also give the bar bars uh, each bar a different color. And in this case, the color represents the salinity of the pumped water from the combined wells. So if it's green, it means the water is potable. But if it turns orange or red even, then it means that the water is too saline and can't be used anymore. And this is all results from a groundwater model. Uh, you could equally think of applications for surface water models, but uh, it's really a good illustration of how you can use Python to create graphs like these. And if you have time series data, you can do it for every time step for which you have output from your model. And then using an external package, you can stitch these together and create animations like this one. And if I present movies like this at a conference, I always hope that people are interested in the science behind it, but frequently people just ask me, so how did you create that video? So I think it really demonstrates how powerful the, this visualization can be. So that's just one example. Um, I have another example of uh, showing model output as well. This is um, what I'm about to show you are results from a ModFlow model. And Chris and Luke have already shown you some great examples of graphs that you can create using the matplotlib library in Python. Um, what they haven't mentioned yet is that that library also has the capability of visualizing data in 3D. So if I start this movie, um, now we are looking at an area from the top. You can't see much yet except for the uh, topographic map which is, by the way, from OpenStreetMaps, which is another great resource that you can tap into to get free topographic map data. But if I show this, you can see how we are rotating the 3D image. We can turn around so we can look at it from multiple angles. And I'll briefly pause it just to tell you what we're looking at. 
Here you see um, a cross section. This is a cross sectional model that I did. And you can see these lines, which are flow lines. So a water particle that enters the subsurface flows along this line here to this observation well screen here. I can put in some information about the geology. You can see we have a four layer system, pretty simple, but it's uh, shown here as different colored uh, layers. And also I'm, what I did uh, is I added the flow lines that I calculated using a three-dimensional model. So I have the cross-sectional model and I also have a three-dimensional model and I can compare them. And in this case, the um, objective was to establish how different they are. And fortunately they look quite similar. So that's all stuff that you can do with the Matplot library, visualizing three-dimensional data, pretty powerful. Then I'd like to show you this example um, where you can combine time series data with Google Earth. Um, and this is done using a package which is called the simple KML package. And it is truly simple. All you need is a few lines of Python codes to get this working. And this is also an application that I will be demonstrating during the course that we teach in June. So this is a very typical situation for groundwater hydrologists and surface water hydrologists alike. We have some observation points, in this case, observation wells. We have coordinates for these wells. And also you can see all the different tab sheets here. Each tab sheet represents any of these wells. And if I can click on one of them, we can see that we have a time step and a measured head. So I can plot this data using uh, matplotlib as uh, time series graphs. But then with this simple KML package, I can also create a Google Earth KML file that has the geographical coordinates. So if I, visual, if I open up that uh, KML file in Google Earth, I can see all the push pins that show the locations of my wells. And then if I, can cl if I click on one of these push pins uh, within Google Earth, so this is outside Python, but all within Google Earth, I can bring up the image of the hydrograph time series. So here you can see the head versus time for that particular one. You can close it again and then click on another one. But this is also a great way to distribute your data to people that are not um, first in Python. And it's very easy to send them this KML file um, and then they can immediately uh, look at your data or their data in uh, Google Earth on their own computer. So. The final example that I'd like to show is not so much data visualization, more uh, data interpretation, if you like. And this is an example of a pump test. So we are pumping an aquifer at a known rate for a particular period of time. In this case, it's uh, one day. Um, we measure the drawdown that this pumping causes at an uh, observation well nearby. And that is uh, shown here as these dots here. And then what we typically have, we typically do this to um, quantify the hydraulic parameters of our aquifer. So uh, we know something about the aquifer. In this case, it's a confined aquifer. So we can use the TIES uh, solution to calculate the drawdown. And if I do that, I, I try to get a set of aquifer parameters um, that gives me a good fit to my data. And in uh, Python, there are already some uh, least squares reg regression tools available within the NumPy package and the SciPy package, for example. But there's also the LMFit package, and that takes the capabilities a step further. And um, this is the only piece of code that I'll be showing during this presentation, but it shows you how easy it is. The real script is a little bit larger, but it's really these four lines or four, six lines of codes code that it's all about. I have here the pandas package, which I use to read in my data. And then I define my model parameters, the storativity, the transmissivity, and the flow rate. I can set some parameter ranges, some initial parameter estimates. And then using uh, the LMFit package, I try to find the optimal values of these parameters so that my uh, modeled uh, drawdown fits to the observed data. So that's the, the last thing that I wanted to show. Also wanted to point out, want to point out that uh, it was already known back in the 1980s that uh, Python is a really useful tool for uh, hydrologists. Um, and I think that uh, many of you have already discovered the possibilities of Python. So it's good that you're on board. 
Um, but uh, yeah, the capabilities of Python are constantly expanding. So there's always a lot of stuff to learn. And I also hope that this webinar has given you a good appetite for the course that is uh, upcoming in June. So with that, I'd like to leave it and hand over to Craig. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Luke, Chris, and Vincent um, for the, those presentations. That was some great material. Um, we are now going to open it up to uh, the Q&A line. Um, I guess one, one uh, interesting term that has come up that I, th I think, you know, people who are into statistics and stochastics and all that, um, uh, you know, are probably familiar with the data wrangling versus data mining terms and how there are specific definitions for it. But when I hear data wrangling, uh, you know, sometimes we spend a lot of time on our projects trying to get data together and it's not the right data. You can't put it together. I feel a bit like this guy getting dragged through the... Uh, arena here sometimes when I'm trying to wrangle my own data, which in my case, as a more of a surface water guy, a lot of times it's terrain data and then, you know, uh, flood levels and, you know, how many of these can you put together and, and make something meaningful out of it. So I appreciate that, uh, those definitions that you've given us. Um, again, keep in mind, um, everybody watching this, um, if you saw something and you're like, oh man, you know, uh, that, that was only five minutes or 10 minutes of some material that I really wanted more of. That was the idea. We wanted to give you a teaser, a taste of uh, what's coming in these courses and let you do it yourself. So you can sign up for those uh, courses and be able to make some visualizations like you see. And so the dates are there on your screen. Um, you can see uh, them coming up in June and um, you can sign up for these and be able to have some interactive time uh, together with these expert presenters who, as you can tell from the content on these presentations, uh, they know their stuff. And uh, um, yeah, so with that, uh, maybe let's go into Q&A. Um, and while each presenter was speaking, the others uh, have been uh, answering some of the questions. And there have been, looks like about 30, over 30 questions now that have come up. Let's look at some of the potentially the most upvoted ones and maybe go back uh, in order as we uh, did before. And, um, you know, just have a look at those questions that you might have answered. And um, yeah, let's let's see where we go from there. So let's, uh, let's see, who should we start with? Um, anyone want to put your hand up? Um, Chris, uh, why don't you start with yours? Um, I think you answered a couple of them on there. Uh, you know, let us know what you think. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm just ticking through the the Q and A here to uh, get back to some of those questions now. Um, it was good to see um, the uh, the time series uh, section did promote uh, generate a bit of discussion here. Like, I really enjoyed doing this Q and A part. Yeah, there's, there's obviously uh, people are doing um, a bit of time series analysis themselves and. You can tell by the questions, you know, they're, they're informed questions. Um, it, like uh, Kazir um, Zaman asked if whether, um, whether when, when performing detrending de -trending or differencing of data in Python, um, whether it's uh, whether the, the best order of differencing is, is, um, is calculated automatically. And really, in my experience, um, it, it's a real trial and error process, um, the method of detrending. Um, in terms of the desired outcome, whether it's a time series method like moving average or if it's a, a frequency domain method like a, a, a pass filtering method, it really depends on, uh, on what you're trying to achieve and, and you, you, you generally don't want to lose too much data um, through the filtering that you do. And so, yeah, it's really a, a, a trial and error method in my experience. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, it looks like the most upvoted question does have to do with R. So um, who's got the most experience with R here who can comment on the comparison? Uh, I, can, I can take that. I've, I've dabbled in R a bit. Um, as far as I, I can tell, um, obviously there's differences in the way it's, uh, um, there are obvious differences between R and Python where R is started from a statistics community where Python is more started from the programming community. So there is, then that kind of still stays in the way they approach packages and how they write um, their analysis. But in terms of functionality, uh, they're often very comparable, both in comput computational efficiency and in packages available. And especially because um, R started from statistics, there is a huge amount of packages and information available to do time series analysis and any kind of stochastic analysis in R. What I personally find is that if you want to interact with uh, external models, for instance, running GR4J or Modflow, um, because of the link with uh, programming or the origins in programming, I often find Python is more suited for those kind of uh, interactions and processing of external data. Um, and it's, it's really hard to make a 
head-to-head -head comparison between R and Python. And actually, there are plenty of libraries that actually combine the two. And one of the, my colleagues, he actually started coding a geostatistics package in R, and he's now transforming that into Python because it is um, wider used, and it is probably a better um, better supported and can be more efficient. Thanks. I do see a few questions on uh, the, the deal with TwoFlow, and so yeah, the the the, the um, uh, experts from WBM, uh, you know, who write that model, uh, have plenty of resources available specifically within that community. So they've got their own wiki sites and everything, and libraries that you can access. Um, anybody who's deeply into TwoFlow um, is probably already well familiar with some of the things we've brought up on these webinars. So um, we we have other resources available for those looking uh, to do this uh, with TwoFlow flow. Um, the other question, uh, one, one that has been upvoted quite a bit, and I think you mentioned some of this is just on, yeah, quality control. Um, any, any comments on, uh, on quality control um, and, and, you know, how that could be, you know, improved? That one got about 15 upvotes, so I uh, just want to make sure we, we address that uh, in a little more detail. I'm just going to take that, because I really like Vince's answer on that, that it is something that you have to be really mindful of. It is very easy to automate tasks and do quite advanced analysis in Python. Um, and especially if you start working with big data sets, it's really hard to kind of check everything. So it is really good practice to be very critical of your own code um, and really put some tests in place to, to check that your, your code is, is really doing what you think it's doing. And it sounds like a trivial thing, but it is not. And there's a lot of things that can uh, fall between the cracks. So it is something we might spend some time on in the course if we if we have time to um, give some examples of how you can basically test your code and make sure that it does what you think it's doing. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Vincent, any specific ones that came up that you wanted to address? No, I just thought I might add, add to what Luke just said that um, uh, obviously, one of the great things about Python is also that a lot of the libraries that have been developed have been made available online on GitHub, so they're accessible to everyone. And oh, that's something you could do for your own, the package that you've developed yourself uh, as well, of course. And then other people can have a look at your code and that increases the chance of other people finding uh, maybe errors or mistakes that you've made in the coding. Uh, and of course, that is another way to uh, promote the quality control of your own work, um, but also uh, the, the open source uh, development community as a whole. Um, yeah, so many people are looking at bits of code and are using bits of code and are finding problems. And through this GitHub uh, platform, the, it provides a great way to, to uh, address some of these errors and, and get rid of them. And that's something that we didn't have in the past, of course. And when I started programming in, well, when was it? 25 years ago, none of that existed. And that's all available today. I think that's really great. And one of the great things that uh, the internet has brought us. Yeah, thanks. No, and there's a lot of applications for that. Um, the previous webinar that we had, again, that number 98 one, uh, Kevin Nebbiolo went through an example and and that's available. It's all available for anyone who watches it. Um, I think we've got the GitHub link on there and um, everybody can get to it. Um, and and it's, it's becoming more and more common. I know there's a lot of HackRaz users here as well that uh, attend these these webinars. And, you know, there's a new script uh, scripting tool in HackRaz to be able to customize pretty much anything you want for the output. And you can take your code and pop it right in there. So we, uh, you know, it's, it's great when everybody else can do it for you. And it's just a Windows button, and you can just get things done, um, you know, with a graphical interface. But a lot of times the software doesn't do what you want it to do specifically. And it's great to have these resources available uh, to be able to do this. Um, now, the another upvoted question is about outliers. Um, can't recall if anybody mentioned that yet, um, but I know in our flood frequency analyses, uh, if if you pull out one outlier, all of a sudden, you know, it can change your data results massively. Um, automated uh, packages supporting removing outliers. Um, just uh, so, somebody, again, Chen mentioned uh, trying pandas uh, moving average uh, without great results. Uh, any um, anybody want to tackle that one? Oh. I'll have a go. It's, um, it's talking to a wider thing as well. It's what I find in terms of uh, what's available in functionality in NumPy and SciPy, it's pretty comprehensive, especially if you're looking at the more advanced statistical uh, methods. 
um, SciPy really has most of the statistical distributions and tests implemented. Um, but then the hard part is still trying to figure out which technique will work best for you. So that will be very application specific. Sometimes the moving average will be just what you need, but in other cases, you will need to have a more advanced method. But in terms of the actual the mechanics of loading the time series, doing that filtering, having those tests already implemented, a lot of these things are already in Python available. And it's often a matter of Googling um, which method is best suited for um, uh, which application. I did mention the scikit-learn package because um, outlier detection and removal is a big part of uh, machine learning um, and data analysis uh, in general. Um, and there are quite a lot of examples and tutorials on how to do outlier detection. Um, again, it's a more a question of can you take those generic examples from data science and apply it to hydrology? And that, that's, I think, in a lot of the questions were also around what packages are available for hydrology and hydrological modeling. Um, it's more a question, what do you want to do and see if there's already something out there in the data science world or in NumPy that provides that functionality. And then it's often quite straightforward to just select a method and apply it to your specific data and customize it to what you need rather than waiting on somebody to write the package for you. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. Vincent great. or Chris, any comments on that? To, to follow on from what you said, Luke, and to pick up on a, a separate comment from um, Tarek Leto in Australia, um, uh, an example of this would be uh, the, um, the, the pastors package, which as Vincent mentioned is, is hosted on GitHub. So it's publicly available. It's, you know, it's completely visible and transparent. Um, and yeah, it's a different way of doing time series analysis to what I presented today, but it, it is something I'd like to include in the course later in the year. And it's, you know, decomposing time series into um, components, different, different stresses. Um, and yeah, this is like an, a good example of a, a hydrological application. Um, you don't need to write it from scratch. Someone's already done the hard yards and, you know, it's comparable to um, other packages that already exist in um, MATLAB and R. Uh, yeah, so just to follow on there. Okay. Well, one one thing, um, let's see, a couple of comments. We've got about just a few minutes left. A uh, few people asked about flood frequency analysis uh, in Python. Have a look at that number 98 uh, webinar because uh, there is uh, that, that was the example that we went through. Um, before, some, somebody's actually giving Vincent a chance to plug his book on uh, groundwater modeling. So uh, we'll let you do that in just a second, but let me first plug then CSIRO or CSIRO because this is a global audience. A lot of people may not have heard that. So let's see, maybe Luke, if you want to just uh, tell everybody, what is CSIRO? Should we be pronouncing it CSIRO or CSIRO? What is it? What do they do? And then maybe we'll have Vincent plug his okay. book uh, before we wrap up. CSIRO is basically the organization where Chris and I work for. So we're the, the, the science organization of Australia. And we've got a very large division, land and water, where we're part of. Um, Chris and I are part of the groundwater group, but there's a very large surface water group and environmental informatics group as well. Um, that, and we do a lot of this work in terms of uh, flood forecasting, rainfall runoff modeling, groundwater modeling, data analysis, and a lot of our work uh, we do make open source available. Um, and if, if anyone is interested, um, it's pronounced CSIRO. Um, and a bit of Googling uh, will get you to our outputs and what we do. Great. Sounds sounds good. Now I feel a bit like a talk show host now saying to Vincent, hey, and your book is uh, available, blah, blah, blah. So tell us about your book. Yeah, so the book, uh, the book has been in the making for many years and it's a book on Python modeling, uh, groundwater modeling using Python. And I'm co-authoring it with Mark Bakker, who's at the Technical University in Delft. Um, and the thing, the project uh, takes a lot of time. And one of the reasons is that it got a little bit out of hand and the material that we put in ended up being a lot more than we anticipated in the upfront. And um, actually we've been recently talking to the publisher and it looks like there will be two books. So one book will mainly focus on analytical uh, solutions and the other book will uh, focus on uh, numerical modeling. Um, so uh, hopefully the prints will or the proofs will go to the publisher this summer uh, and then it will take another few months before the book uh, becomes available. It's been a long time in the making, but um, yeah, I've, um, 
if it's not done by Christmas this year, I'll just skip the Chris Christmas holidays and continue working on it until it's done because it needs to go out very, very soon. So, sounds good. Okay. I no, appreciate that. Um, yes. Uh, tune in for these, uh, these courses coming up. Uh, we'll give everybody a chance here to give uh, some final closing remarks, uh, but do fill out this. Uh, if you leave us here, uh, do fill out the survey. Use that link on your phone right now to complete the survey. If you can let us know what you want to see more of um, and what, what kind of content you've, uh, you, you want to see us uh, present to the industry. So with that, um, yeah, let's just go back in order again. And, uh, Chris, Luke, and then Vincent, closing remarks. Yeah, I uh, just pre appreciate the opportunity. I uh, really enjoy seeing the, the interest, the level of interest in Python uh, and its applications. Um, yeah, yeah, look forward to, uh, to the course later in the year. Sounds good. Uh, same to me as um, always blown away by how lively the chat function is and how much interest there is. Um, feels like we're preaching to the converted. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the, uh, to the course. Vincent, uh, say farewell from uh, over across the other side of the world. I will, yeah. The day has started here. And um, I think that, um, like so many of you, I'll be spending the day in my home office because of the corona situation. Um, I've been doing that for more than a year now. And I have found that there hasn't been a single day on which I haven't, used, haven't been using Python. It's really become a standard tool uh, in my toolbox. And um, yeah, I don't think I would be able to do my work without it. So right. it's, um, yeah. Anyway. Sounds good. Well, Craig, thank do you, you play guitar? That's one of the first things <laughs> in the chat. Oh yeah. uh, yes, ba badly, but uh, but but gladly. I love playing guitar, but it's 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 bedtime songs for the kids. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> yes, um, I, I do have a few videos where I pull some songs into my Hecarez training. So uh, yes, uh, interesting uh, that would come up. Well, thanks for that, guys. Uh, I do appreciate uh, your participation here. Um, for everybody out there, you know these these are volunteer sessions. Um, when we do these webinars, you know the presenters we get on board for you are here. Um, you know presenting this material to you uh, and we just want to get it out there to the industry and give you the tools you need uh, to you know do the best job we can of uh, showing how water moves around the world and uh, how we can get it where it needs to go and keep it from where it shouldn't be uh, where it's causing harm but you can see here some courses that will help you in that uh, do sign up for these if you get a chance um, your screen should have all, uh, a whole list of these on there with um, from fish passage to coastal modeling and bridge hydraulics. We've got a lot of great content for you, but you tell us what you want to see uh, after that. We've got everything through June here. What July, August, September, October have in store for us, that's up to you. So please let us know. Thanks so much for everybody's participation. Hope to see you in the course or on future webinars. We'll sign off for now. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the AustralianWaterSchool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.